Now, as I've said, you grow your plants to the required height. But what is the required height? Well, that, like everything else about this sport, depends on other things. It depends mostly on the amount of light and to some degree how you hang them. Lights without reflecting hoods can be hung in the center of your plants. With multiple lights, they offer light all around, which allows you to grow bigger plants. Bigger plants can equal bigger yields. Plants grown naturally at the right latitude can get extremely large. I saw one in Australia that was 12 feet tall and 18 feet across and it yielded about six pounds. Now, the efficiency of the sun is pretty hard to duplicate indoor. Outside, about uh, 5,000 lumens of light hit each square foot of ground. Now, one lumen is the equivalent amount of light emitted from a candle that would be about one foot away from it. This is also an indication of the number of what are known as photons that uh, actually illuminate our world. Now, the number of uh, lumens originating this, at the sun is immense and diminishes in, ten, in its intensity as it travels to the Earth, some 93 million miles. <clears throat> now, the same thing happens with your lights. The farther away you are from the light, the less intense it is. A lot less, as it turns out. Now, the 1,000 watt high-pressure sodium gives off about 140 lumens per watt, or about 140,000 lumens per for that light. However, these lumens are spreading out in all directions, so only roughly 10% of that is actually going to hit your plants. Now, that's only about 14,000 lumens. That's one foot away in one square foot. Now, three feet away from that same 1,000 watt HPS, the plants are only receiving one-ninth of the original lumens per square foot because those original lumens are now spread over nine square feet, giving each square foot only about 1,500 or so lumens. Metal halides are even less efficient than that. Now using reflectors on your light will corral much of this light and reflect it back down to the plant, but it's still not like the sun's light in that with the sun it has traveled so far already that the extra few feet that your plant represents doesn't make any difference. <clears throat> but in our rooms you can see how height is going to make a difference. Unless you have multiple thousands of watts burning, it's best to take advantage of the most intense light with short plants and preferably a cooled light system so you can get the lights as close as possible. Now you may have seen ads for the new gizmo called the cage. Now in this setup, they are capturing this concept beautifully and utilizing the lumen output from the lights way more efficiently. They're actually hanging four 400s down the center and use about 72 planting sites and are getting absolutely huge yields off these things. Now this is not something that you couldn't easily make yourself. We thought of simply hanging the tubes around the lights, drippers to each one with catchers underneath, could be air cooled with a right glass tube. You can see with a little ingenuity that uh, wouldn't be hard to do. Now the, the thing that they've actually done here with the cage is they've taken a sea of green and wrapped it up around the light, taking absolute maximum advantage of the output of these lights. Now I know you'd like me to just hammer through this, but uh, everything is so interconnected without understanding one aspect, the others are gonna go out of whack. Now, as soon as the seedling begins to grow, you're going to need to address the pH and the food you're going to give them. These two elements are absolutely as vital as your lights, because if either one is not right, you might as well be growing in the dark. Now, what pH is, is a scale that shows how strongly electrical charges hold atoms and molecules together. The nutrients, water, trace elements, soil particles, and gases at the roots all have different electrical charges holding them apart or bringing them together. Now on the pH scale, acids are pH 0 to 7, while what are known as bases are 7 to 14. At the same time, acidic pH means more negative charges and basic pH more positive charges. To have the correct balance, the pH in the plant and the pH in the nutrient solution must be fairly close. 
If the pH goes too high or too low, signs of nutrient deficiencies will start showing, not because the nutrient wasn't there, but because the plant could not get it. Now, as far as nutrients are concerned, these are soluble solutions containing nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, trace elements, and minerals. Now, these all exchange electrons and ions to rearrange themselves in the chlorophyll and proteins of the plant. That allows the factory and the leaves to make the sugar that the plant uses for energy to grow. Now, there's tons of premixed nutrients available in the marketplace. And you know what? Your plant doesn't care which one you buy, as long as it contains what the plant can use. And virtually all of them do these days. <clears throat> so unless you're a chemist or understand these things, you don't need to go on some mystical search looking for the perfect food. Everybody has their favorite formula that they swear by. And that shows me that uh, many combinations are going to work. Now most of the pictures that you've seen in grow guides over the years showing us trace element deficiencies those aren't likely going to happen because the trace elements aren't there. Those are going to be because of wrong pH. Now, how much you feed your plants is measured in what is known as parts per million, or ppm. And this measurement shows us how much nutrient is in the water after you've mixed it in. And it's measured with a, what we call a ppm meter. So, for example, a thousand parts per million indicates 1,000 units of nutrient in 1 million units of water. Now, all the nutrients are salt, so this is really only a final reading of the total salts in the mix. It doesn't tell you how much of each element is present. The ppm meter is also an electrical conductivity, or EC meter. It works by measuring how fast electrons can work their way from one side of the probe to the other. In distilled water, because it is totally clean, the electrons can find no salts as stepping stones between the probes, so the meter reads zero. As nutrient salts are added, the electrons find more stepping stones between the probes. Now this causes the electrons to travel faster and the EC increases. The warmer the solution, the more active the electrons become, and so the EC changes with temperature. Now, even as exact as this sounds, there still are variables. An EC reading of 2 can indicate a ppm of anywhere from 1,000 to 1,400. Now, this is really due to how the manufacturers calibrate the meter in the first place, and it is more likely closer to 14. Now, the result of all this uh, ion and electron stuff for your plant is that th there's a constant battle taking place at the roots for water. The nutrient solution, if too high in salt, will not want to give up the water too easily. In fact, if too high, it'll actually try to grab water back from the roots. It's the same as when you eat salty food. You want to drink lots of water afterwards. Now, the more energy that you root uses to extract the water, the less they have for growth. Now this forces the plant to show nutrient deficiencies, and then more salts are added to fix the apparent problem, the worse the problem gets. In hydroponic systems with a reservoir holding the nutrient, the plant takes whatever it needs and leaves the rest, and salts start to build up in this solution. Now this is going to become toxic if the solution is not changed regularly. And the system should have one day a week on straight pH balanced water to avoid buildups and the nutrient solution completely exchanged. Now this battle that rages at the roots is influenced as well by the medium in which the root exists and that medium's willingness to give up the water. Now this is called its cation exchange capacity or CEC. What a thrilling world of acronyms. <laughs>